Scientist. Join me on a cinematic journey that will expose a destructive religious lie. A lie that originated in ancient Rome and has endured unchallenged for 1700 years. A damnable hoax that has been cunningly woven into the very fabric of the world's largest religion, Christianity. The dogma of this pernicious falsehood is taught by all of Catholicism and is also supported and embraced by a staggering 99% of Protestant denominations as well. An ungodly fabrication that is so demonic that it is a primary driving force that inspires over 2 billion Catholics and Christians to unknowingly violate one of the eternal, handwritten in stone, Ten Commandments of their God and most have done so for their entire lives. So, brace yourselves, my friends, for we're about to confront the greatest lie ever told. Centuries ago, extraordinary measures were taken by both Catholics and Protestants to keep this lying narrative hidden from the masses. But thanks to the Most High God, we now live in the information age, in the veil of misinformation by the religious institutions that we've trusted since childhood can now be exposed. Some denominations are honestly unaware of their untruthful theology that they've taught since their inception. But I still assert that misinformation of this magnitude is inexcusable, especially since this falsity involves one of the foundational precepts of the Christian faith. In Western culture, lies are often categorized as big or small, but this particular lie stands out as one of epic proportions. Please know that I don't use the term lie as hyperbole. Again, this falsity impacts over 2 billion living souls, and not to mention the billions of sincere Christians that have lived and died since 300 AD that were never provided the truth of this forthcoming message. With that in mind, this church-inspired deception may well qualify for one of the greatest lies ever told. As you shall soon see, with your own eyes and in your own Bible, this religious myth is so embedded in our psyche that it even defies basic mathematic principles. And I promise to speak on the poor math skills of Christianity when I reveal the devastating truth behind their insidious falsehood. Sadly, this unbiblical narrative has remained largely unquestioned for 1,700 years. But an old lie is still a lie. And because of this entrenched head start, cognitive dissonance will likely prevent most believers from accepting the irrefutable facts that will unfold during this presentation. Admittedly, there are instances where two or more seemingly opposing facts can coexist as truths. For instance, someone can be both rich and frugal simultaneously. However, this situation doesn't fall into that category. This is an either-or scenario. What we've been taught is either 100% accurate or 100% false. My friends, I solemnly affirm that the people of God have been subjected to a form of indoctrination and we've been brainwashed into believing unbiblical fiction by the churches we've known and loved all our lives. For many of you, this disinformation will end today. But for many others, the following famous cliche will apply. You can't handle the truth. In a very few minutes, I'll fully explain the heresy that occurred 
17 centuries ago by the Church of Rome, which, as we all know, later became the Roman Catholic Church. But first, it's very important that we briefly explore the catalysts behind the heresy. The why behind the lie. A shocking and intentional mistranslation conspiracy was conceived by the Church of Rome in the early 4th century. A conspiracy that was motivated purely by the desire to align with the lifelong sun worshiper, Constantine the Great. In exchange for this clear tampering of what's considered the most sacred book on the planet, Rome would cease their murderous persecution of Christians, and Christians would no longer be considered enemies of the empire. This ancient alliance was so successful that shortly thereafter, Constantine the Great legalized the Christian faith in 313 AD with the Edict of Milan. And a later successor, Emperor Theodosius, made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire in 380 AD. Much was gained by both sides with this union of church and state. Early Christians were once perceived as persecuted fanatics, often meeting a grisly fate in the jaws of lions within the bloody Colosseums. But the Church of Rome underwent a remarkable transformation. Over time, it extended to a position of power rivaling even that of the emperor himself. And Rome gained a multitude of Christians that would blindly kill and be killed as willing soldiers in the glorified army of the now Christianized Roman Empire, slaughtering and conquering other nations all in the name of the cross. This sounds nothing like the Christ of the Bible. Another motivating factor was the necessity to disassociate the Church of Rome from the stigma of the Jewish religion during that historical period. The Jews were still considered as enemies of the Roman Empire, and their persecution did not cease with the rise of Christianity. As a matter of fact, 4th century Christians became brutal persecutors of Jews themselves. Some say this persecution continued through the Nazi occupation of Germany, with Hitler having the support and blessings of the Catholic Church. Furthermore, the father of the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, was an unmuzzled anti-Semite as well. Initially, Luther had hoped that his reform efforts would lead to the conversion of the Jews to Christianity, and he wrote positively about them in some of his earlier works. However, as his expectations were not realized, he became frustrated and his writings took a darker turn. In his later years, Luther wrote several treatises and sermons that contained strong anti-Jewish sentiments. For example, his work titled On the Jews and Their Lies, published in 1543, was particularly notorious for his harsh language and discriminatory recommendations against the Jews. In this work, Luther advocated for burning synagogues, confiscating Jewish prayer books, forbidding rabbis from teaching, and encouraging Jews to convert to Christianity or leave. And the third motivation was likely the most important to Emperor Constantine. Constantine was a lifelong sun worshiper, as was most of Rome in that era. And Sunday, the day of the sun, was literally a holy day for the Romans, as well as for their emperor. So, with these facts in mind, how could Constantine the Great connect his holy day of the sun with the Christian religion? Because the Christians honored the same day that the Jews kept, a day commanded as holy and handwritten in stone by Yahweh himself, the seventh day Sabbath, Saturday. And this contention over what would be the sacred 
and Holy Weekday of the newly affirmed Christian religion is where the plot thickens. And this, my friends, is when the greatest lie ever told was born. Seventeen hundred years of deception, lies, misinformation, and basically false doctrine throughout all of Christianity and Catholicism. In your own Bible, with the Holy Spirit's help, I'm going to show you that the Bible never said, not in the original Greek language that it was written in, the Bible never said that Christ rose on Sunday. It never said that he rose on the first day of the week. The Bible says in the original Greek language that Christ rose on the Sabbath day, not Sunday. And this truth has been hid from you for 1,700 years. And I know some are going to hate me. Some are going to call me a devil. Some are going to say I'm leading people to hell. I've heard it all when I've tried to share this truth. in plain. I'm going to show it to you in plain English on the screen in the a Bible lexicon that the original day, every time the, the every time the resurrection was mentioned of our Lord and Savior, the Lamb of God Himself, it was always said to have occurred on the Sabbath day, not the first day of the week. So I know this is a hard truth, and I'm going to show you right now. So let's let's get started. And as painful as this is for me. And as, a pain, and as painful as it's going to be for some of you, the truth must prevail. This is indeed the most damnable mistranslation conspiracy in the history of Catholicism and Christianity. Let me say that one more time. What I'm about to share with you is the most damnable mistranslation conspiracy in all the history of Catholicism and Christianity. Buckle your seatbelts, stay prayerful, accept the truth, and reject lies. Because you know, at the end of the day, all men are liars, but God is truth. And we can't blame the Father for this, this horrible, this wicked deception that has been perpetrated in the church for 1,700 years. We cannot blame Yahweh for this. We must blame men. And when men touch things, we tend to taint things. I mean, it is what it is. We tend to taint everything we touch to some degree, no matter how well-meaning we are. So let me stop talking. Let me get to the Bible and let me show you what I'm talking about. What you need to do is check it. If you have a Thayer's lexicon or or I'm going to use on the screen a blue letter Bible uh, lexicon to show you what the original language said and show you that you've been deceived, that I've been deceived, and that Christ did not raise on a, rise on a Sunday. And the reason this matters is because this now means that Sunday has no biblical significance whatsoever, none. That the Sunday that we, that Christians and Catholics hold as sacred has zero biblical relevancy. And that the Sabbath, which is God's holy day from creation, is still the Sabbath. Christ rose on the Sabbath, now thwarting the, the false idea that Sunday was holy because Christ rose on Sunday. This is going to change all that. And it's going to also, if you are an obedient child of God, it's going to make you question whether you should obey the holy commandment of God, which you should. The fourth commandment says to keep the Sabbath day holy. In this next couple of minutes, you're going to see that you need to question that because are you a lifelong commandment breaker because you thought Sunday was a holy day, which it is not. And the Bible is going to show you that it is not in a moment. Let's go to, as we go on the screen here, what you need to do on, and what I'm going from is the blue letter Bible uh, resource. And the blue letter Bible has been around for, I don't know how long it is a well-known, very well-respected resource. It's not something I've made up to trick you. I'm not trying to trick you. I'm trying to share with you the truth. As painful as the truth is that the churches have either misled or been misinforming you for 1,700 years. 
let's look at it for ourselves. So as we go to, to the Blue Letter Bible, what you would do is put, put blueletterbible.org in your browser and go there. Once you go to the screen, this is what you'll see. And once you get on that screen, we're going to look at all the resurrection scriptures to see that that Christ never rose on the first day. And I know your King James Bible and most all translations Bible, one, one doesn't say the first day of the week was Jubilee 2000, but that's another story. They got it right. But all the other translations that you'll find will always say first day of the week, first day of the week, first day of the week. But let's look at what the Bible said when it was written, if it said first day of the week. This is all I'm asking you to do, as painful as it might be to look. But you can't be lazy. You've got to be a Berean, a Berean Christian and look and see for yourself. And I'm making it easy for you to do so. I'm going to put it on the screen for you to see with your own eyes. And then you go behind me and make sure I'm not doing some kind of trickery again and, and using some kind of weird um, lexicon and fooling you with some, some evilness. You look for yourself. You must be a Berean Christian in this day of in this information age. You have to be aware. This is not like it was back in the 90s and the 80s and before. You, you had to believe the preacher, whatever he said, because after all, he went to seminary, didn't he? He should know better than you, shouldn't he? Well, not necessarily so. Not knocking preachers. I'm just saying we are to study to show ourselves approved. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's what we're about to do right now. And we're going to put this myth to rest that Christ rose on Sunday. We must accept the truth. We must reject lies and misinformation. We must, as Christians, as Catholics, whatever you are, as Bereans, we must accept the truth, period. Let's look and see. So we go to the screen, blueletterbible.org. We put in, there are six resurrection scriptures, and then there are two more scriptures that Christians and Catholics use to support a Sunday worship service, which those are debunked in the same, uh, same way that even those two scriptures say Sabbath as well. Let's look for ourselves. I've talked enough. Let's go. Stay prayerful. Matthew 28 is the first resurrection scripture. So what you do when you go to the blueletterbible.org, you go to the screen, you put in Matthew 28, and then you go there. All right, so this is where it takes us. So now, let's look at Matthew 28, 1, is where it talks about the re resurrection. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. So we know the scripture. So so now, while we're looking at this, it says, but basically, after after the Sabbath, it says, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, it's telling you that Christ was gone. But let's look at the original language. We're going to click on the tools. Make sure we just click on tools. And it's going to take you to the interlinear. Um, don't, don't go down here. You're not looking at the, these things. We're going to click on tools and just click, click tools. It'll take you to, now you'll see what the original language, word for word, was said in the Bible itself. So now, look at this. It's very interesting. In the end is a phrase which has this word here with strong concordance. Then it says, of the Sabbath. Notice this word Sabbath here. It's G4521. And it means Sabbaton. So in, after the Sabbath had passed, uh, Matthew 28 was telling us, See, in the end of the Sabbath, see here, after the Sabbath basically had passed, that word is 4521 Sabbaton. Then it said, as it began to dawn toward the first, and this is a mistranslation, but we'll come back to that, heist. But then look, day, day is not even, because this day is not there because it was, wasn't in the original scripture. Day doesn't have a corresponding words because that means that the translators added that word, but that's not the big deal. Let's look at the next one. Of the week is a phrase. So as they said, the first day of the week, check this out. It's the same word, sabbaton. See this? At the end, at, after the Sabbath, remember, now let's go back. I know, I know I lost some of you. At the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene, all right? So, 
at the end of the Sabbath, 4521, which, which means Sabbaton, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. Well, that's the same word. So it should have said, at the, after the Sabbath had passed, as it says in one other uh, one that we're going to see, after the Sabbath had passed, as it began to tor dawn toward the Sabbath, because remember now, it's the same word, sabaton. Sabaton is used twice. Well, sir, how can it be past the Sabbath and still be the Sabbath? Well, that answer is simple. And that is because there were two Sabbaths that week that Christ died. We all remember the Passover. And I'm going to show you the other scriptures too. So I know it's going to get a little long-winded, but this is one of the most important tenets of Christianity. The day that Christ rose, you need to not be lazy. You need to not be apathetic. You need to stay with me and, and look for yourself so that you can either learn from the Bible the truth or you can, can, can basically reject what I'm teaching and call me a heretic. So whatever your reason to stay with me, stay with me in any event. So there were two Sabbaths that week. One occurred the day after Passover. If you'll look at Leviticus 23, Passover was the, of course, we know Christ did the Passover service. And the next day, there's the what's called a ceremonial feast day Sabbath called Feast of an Unleavened Bread. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a literal Sabbath. That's why they had to get Christ off the cross before that Sabbath began that evening. It wasn't the Friday Sabbath, but the regular seventh day Sabbath, because think about this. This is why you can never, no matter what kind of tricky math, and believe me, Christians and Catholics have used all kind of tricky math to try to make this thing work. It cannot work, but no matter what kind of tricky math you use, Jesus himself said, or Yeshua as I call him, said that he would be in the grave three days and three nights. Not just three days. You can't. So you can try to be tricky if you want to say he died on a Friday, a little bit of Saturday, a little bit of Sunday. You can say the three days and, and, and do tricky math. But he said in Matthew 12, 40, that he would be in the grave three days and three nights. And so when you do a Friday, you can't, you can't make that magic to make three days and three nights. Christians do and Catholics do somehow, but you can't. If, if you, I may not be a college graduate, but I know how to count to three. And if it's Friday night and then Saturday night and then he was gone Sunday morning, I'm, I got two nights there, even if I'm being generous. That's two nights, not three nights. So that's a problem right there. But we're not going to focus on that too much. But this, that in and of itself, simple math, disproves a, a Friday crucifixion and a Sunday resurrection by virtue of the Lord's own prophecy in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. Let's continue because it's going to be the same theme, the same revelation, the same truth for all, every one of the resurrection scriptures that will say that we will look and see the original word used to describe the day that our Savior rose was never the first day of the week. It was always Sabaton. And Sabaton, before we move on, let me make sure I make, you, make this clear. Let's look at the definition of Sabaton. So we're here on Matthew 28. So Sabaton, all I would need to do is click on Sabaton. Let's go back to here where see it says, of the Sabbath. Now, G4521 is Sabbaton. I'm going to come back to this and we're going to go to the next the next resurrection scripture, but I have to prove myself because I know I'm rocking some people's world with this truth and it's not, it, they're, they're rejecting it in their spirit. But let's look what Sabbaton means because every time Christ, the, the Bible says Christ rose, it was Sabbaton. So Sabbaton means, it means of Hebrew origin, the Sabbath, a day of weekly repose from secular avocations, also the observance of the institution itself by extension. And it says an, in an interval between two Sabbaths, likewise the plural and all of the above applications, Sabbath or Sabbath days. And so, and we're gonna, we're gonna come back to that in a minute because I'm gonna tell you how, how the, latter churches and the translators try to get a little slick with that. But let's look at all the resurrections. Now, now again, Sabbath 
And let's look at some, some definitions of Sabbath. Let's, let's go before I move on. Matthew 12, 1. At the time Jesus went on the Sabbath day, see that G45, 21, through the corn, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck the ears of corn. We all know that, that, that verse because people, Christians use it to try to justify breaking the Sabbath. But he didn't break the Sabbath commandment. He, he, he bent the Sabbath principles, the Mosaic law principles of the Sabbath, not the commandment itself. The fourth commandment doesn't say doesn't pick, don't pick an ear of corn. So you, you look at Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11 for yourself. That's another, that's another story. Let's look at this verse, uh, Matthew 12, um, verse 5. Or have you not read in the law that on Sabbath days, see that? G 45, 21. This means this is the Sabbath. It is, it is described, Sabbaton is defined as Sabbath 59 times in the New Testament. Sabbaton is a Greek word and is defined 59 times in the New Testament as Sabbath. The only time that it changed is when the Catholics got a hold of it, the Roman Church got a hold of it and made it to mean week. And then added day of the in front of it to make it make sense. Because there was a let let, let me let me go back and show you where we are. Let me go back to the resurrection scriptures because I digress. I'll get off on a whole tangent, and I don't want this to be an hour long. Let's go look at these other scriptures um, real quick. So I'm going to go up here. We're still on where we were, and I'm going to put in the next resurrection scripture, which is in Mark. I'm going to type in Mark when I learn how to type 16. Let's go and see what the Bible says when Christ rose from the dead. Now, Mark 16, 1 and 2 is where it's talking about the resurrection as well. Mark 16, 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, see here's again the first day of the week, they came to the sepulchre, the rising of the sun. So let's look at these. Let's go back. Remember, click on tools in your blue letter Bible.org. Click on tools. And let's see what the original Greek said. Did it say, did it really say first day of the week? Or did it say our Lord and Savior rose on the Holy Sabbath day? Let's see. So verse one, and, which is that Greek word, when, that Greek word, the, ho, that Greek word, Sabbath, 4521, Sabbaton, right, was passed. You don't argue with that. The Sabbath was passed, so the next day is Sunday. You presume. I presume for all my life as well. But let's keep looking. See, let the Bible answer itself. Mary, you see Maria, word for word. Now, Magdalene, see that word for that. And Mary, the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices. And let's go on now to verse two. This is where it gets interesting. Click on the tools now. And when, and, pardon me, and very Early in the morning, the first day they have here, heist again, which again, that's another story, should be one. I'm not even going to touch this one because that's going to make it too long. That's a mistranslation too. Let me leave it there. It should be one Sabbath or a certain Sabbath, something like that. Never translated in all the rest of the Bible as first. Never. Heist is never translated as first until the Romans needed it to say be first. Otherwise, 272 other times, it was translated as one. So one Sabbath, if you will. But I'm going to let you have it. Let's go to this one. Day, remember like in that other one that we looked at in Matthew 28? There's no word for it because it wasn't in the original manuscript. There's no Greek word here because there's a Greek word for day. I think it's hammer or hammer, hammer. I don't speak Greek. I don't pretend that I do. But it's hammeria, hammer Something like that. There's a Greek word for day. They didn't put it here out of integrity because it was not in the original manuscript of the week now. So now they had to take, see this? Sabaton now means Sabbath, but they made it mean of the, had to add of the in front of it to make it fit their Sunday narrative. So as we said earlier, this is verse two. So what it should read, and I know I might be confusing some, but I think in the Lord's 
by the Lord's Holy Spirit, we should, this is pretty simple to see that the, the day that they're claiming Christ rose on was Sabbaton. And Sabbaton is the Sabbath. So as we see here in verse two, the scripture said, and very early in the morning, the first day of the week, which it should have said, and very early in the morning, one Sabbath, they came into the sepulcher. I know some of you don't believe me yet, and I'm going to keep on going. We're going to look at every one of these resurrection scriptures, and you won't find one that says in the original Greek, Sunday, or the first day of the week. Not one. Not in the original Greek. That's all these mistranslations thereafter, but not in the original Greek. Let's go to the next one. Let's, let's keep moving on. So that was Matthew um, 28, I mean, Mark 16, 1 and 2. The next one, next one is Luke. I'm going to put Luke 24. And let's, let's bring it up. It's going to be the same story, the same situation. There's going to be no difference. We're going to look at all, all these resurrection scriptures and they're going to say the same thing. Luke 24, 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. So now they're coming to the tomb to anoint the Savior the first day of the week, the KJV claims, and the Savior is gone. Let's look at the tools again. Click on tools. It says, now upon the first, which again, mistranslation, let me let it go, day, missing, no, no Greek word for day here because it was not there. Of the, again, let me let it go, week. Look at that word week again. The first day of the week. Look what they made week to be. Sabaton. They made week become Sabaton. They added word, day, and then changed the translation of Sabaton, which has, again, 59 times means Sabbath or Sabbath day. But all of a sudden, on these little isolated resurrection scriptures, it don't really mean Sabbath anymore. It means week now. It means sevens or something they try to say to lie to you and deceive you or misinform you. Some people are sincere. So I will say they're misinforming you. But, but, but scholars, the church knew what they were doing. The Roman church knew what they were doing when they were changing this. They were appeasing Constantine because he worshiped the sun god on Sunday and he would stop persecuting, the, he would stop the persecution of the Christians in exchange for making his Sunday the holy day of this, this fledgling persecuted religion. So if you give me what I want, Constantine, I imagine him saying, I'll give you what you want. You give you honor my sun god and I will stop, but not only will I stop persecuting with the Christians which have been being persecuted for hundreds of years since the uh, since Christ was even alive, but I not only will I stop the persecution of, of Christians in Rome who had murdered so many, created so many martyrs of Christians that I, that, that you that don't get me on a tangent, but not only will, will did, did Constantine, Constantine say I'll stop the persecution, but I'm going to legalize Christianity. It's going to be legal to be Christian. So, as you see here, the day that they got there was Sabbaton. It was not Sunday, according to the Bible. Let's look at another scripture of the resurrection, which is, um, the next one is uh, John. John chapter 20. I'll just type in John 20. Now, I want you to do this for yourself now. Go see with your own eyes. Don't trust my, my red eyes. <laughs> see, and, 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 and hard to see eyes. See with, see with your own self, please. I, I, I kid, but this is serious business here. This is, this is, this is serious business. We need to stop believing lies and believe God and not blame God for the lies of men, but seek out the truth and know that his holy day is still holy and Sunday ain't that day. Pardon my bad grammar. John chapter 20 reads, the first day of the week, they claim, when Mary 
uh, came Mary early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Well, let's see if that holds up. I say it doesn't. If I was a betting man, I say it doesn't. <laughs> I kid. Anyway, John, let's, let's see what the original Greek said. And, and so we're in John 20, right? The first day of the week. So they claim. But this, the first day, look again, it's very consistent. And, it's, and in KJV, in most KJV Bibles, uh, day of the, with the resurrection scriptures will be in italicized. They will be italicized because when something is italicized, it means it wasn't in the original manuscript, that it was added by the translator. So many uh, KJV Bibles will have that when you look at the resurrection scriptures, it will have day of the in italics, if you will, because it's letting you know that that was added by the translators. But here, as we look at the word for word translation, day is missing. And that's letting you know something right there. Of the is here. And then week again, they came the first day of the week, according to the Bible, to anoint the body or what have you. And look at that day again. It is indeed, once again, as it has always been, Sabbaton. The day of that week, first day of the week, was not the first day of the week. It was the Sabbaton. So again, how do we read the scripture now? The Sabbath, on or the, uh, one Sabbath, or yeah, basically I would say, it would say, because it was whole. Whole was the articles like the, uh, or a, something like that. So the Sabbath cometh Mary Magdalene when it was yet dark, you see, that's a whole different meaning. The Sabbath cometh Mary Magdalene because that's what the Bible says. Didn't say first day of the week. It says the Sabbath, Sabbaton, G4521. Now, those are the scriptures that, that you know, depict the very resurrection of Christ. But before I go to the day where they try to trick you to make you think that the disciples uh, gathered, let's look at John 9, uh, 20, verse 19. And the Sabbaton is mentioned again. Now here we have, it says the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. But as we look at that, look at the tools, it says it again. They said they claimed it was first day of the week, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, but here it says, being the Sabbath. Because he rose on the Sabbath, and that evening, as the evening began to come come, up, come upon them, it was still Sabbath. Sunset had not happened, but it was still Sabbath. Now let me go on to these other scriptures that the two scriptures that I call hallmark scriptures that Christians usually use to say, look, look at the disciples worshiped on the Sabbath, uh, on, on Sunday, on first day of the week. But I beg to differ. Because in those two same scriptures, the Bible still tells us again, it is Sabbaton, not, not Sunday. So let's go take a peek. We're going to go to, the first one is, the, the main one they love to use, I believe, is in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 16. And then the second one is Acts chapter 20, verse 7. But let's look at 1 Corinthians first. So 1 Corinthians, I type that in into the window here. 16. I hope you're going to do this yourself. And we go and see what we've got. Now, what we have here is the where it says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do you. So this is what Christians say. Oh, look, see, they're doing a collection. That means there's a church service and they're passing that little plate around because they're collecting. And so it must be Sunday. Baloney. Let's look at verse two. 
Upon the even if it's true, let's look what verse two says. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered, that there be no gatherings when I come. Let's look at that word, first day of the week again. Let's see if it holds water or doesn't it. Go to our trusty tools. Now again, it said there's a little collection plate, and it say it said collect. You can collect stuff whenever you want, but let's 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 pretend. Let's play along. Let's see what the Bible says here. Let's click on tools for verse two because they claim it's the first day of the week. Bible says something different. Upon the first, which first is heist, which again is translated as one, two hundred and seventy-two times. Heist is translated as one in the New Testament and never translated as first, except for when the Rome and, and Christianity needs it to say first. Uh, a, a handful of times. Anyway, first day of the week. Now look at this, of the week again. They added a phrase here, but there's one word that should have been there. And that word was sabaton. Sabaton is not a phrase. Sabaton is a word and a Sabbath. Uh, or it could be Sabbath day, but a showing of the week. Praise God's mighty name. So that what that one scripture in First Corinthians sixteen, they lean on it every week. I was a member of the Church of Christ for about a year or so, way back in the day, day in the nineties. Yeah, nineties, and they would read that scripture every week before they would do their um, offering. First Corinthians. Chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Oh, if they only knew the truth, right? If they only knew that the scripture they were using, they were using the wrong word for the wrong day and for the wrong reason. So in any event, now let's look at Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 7, has a double whammy that disputes the use of by Christians to say that it's a... Um, that it's a uh, day that the disciples gathered to, for worship. And I'm going to show you that um, also because in Acts chapter 13, it refutes that that the, Christ, that the Gentiles met on the first day of the week. It, Acts 13 will show you the true day, day that the Gentiles worshiped on. And Acts 20, again, ain't it. All right? All right, my grandma. Let's look at Acts chapter 20. I type it in the window, as usual. Very easy to do. You don't have to be a scholar. I'm sure not. This is the information age. Let's use the information. Now, this is also the misinformation age. A lot of bad information. Have we ever learned anything about bad information being out there? Just look at the recent presidential elections. But I digress. The Acts chapter 20 the, they love this verse because they claim upon the first day of the week that the disciples came together to break bread. First of all, breaking bread means eating. They, Christians and I guess Catholics, always read too much into something sometimes to make it fit their narrative. They make, they pretend that breaking bread is having communion. Look, they're having communion on the first day of the week. Well, no, they're breaking bread. In Acts chapter 2, it says they broke bread daily from house to house. Uh, they had communion every day? No. But anyway, let's give them that. Let's pretend that they were having communion. Then the Bible goes on to say, well, well, they came together to break bread, and Paul preached unto them, so forth and so on. So now let's see about this first day of the week again. See if, it holds, see if there's one out of the, what, eight times that we've looked at this bogus or eight times that we looked at this bogus first day of the week, let's see if one of the times actually held, actually holds up to be the first day of the week. Can you get one out of seven or one out of eight or whatever? Let's just see. Are you crossing your fingers to say, maybe this is the one time? Well, you wasted your finger cross. Let's look at Acts chapter 20. And it's going to do the same thing that the Bible has done consistently. It's saying that that day is not the first day of the week. As you see here, upon the first day, day missing, because it wasn't there, of the week is sabaton. So upon the sabaton, or upon one sabaton. 
upon the Sabbath, they came together and broke bread. Is what the Bible said originally. Now, I, I get it. This is hard. It's a hard truth. Nobody likes being lied to their whole lives. No one likes to be uh, misled their whole lives. I don't. But let God be true and every man a liar. Believe God's word and obey his word. You can't be, you can't obey your religion. You can't obey your denomination more than you obey God. You, you, you gotta, you're going to have problems at judgment day if that's your story. And that's the story of many people. They are more faithful to their denomination than they are to the holy word of God. I say this to your shame, if that describes you. It described me for many years. Let me show you one more thing as I close. To show you that the, the New Testament Gentiles kept the holy Sabbath day. The Sabbath was their official day of worship, not a Sunday. And, and this, this two verses is going to show you, it's going to prove that to you. Because let me go there real quick. I'm going to Acts chapter 20, uh, pardon me, Acts chapter 13. And we're going to look at verse 42 through 42 and 44 and see what it says. <clears throat> now, you remember how, I, you, you, you know how I've been showing you whenever it said first day of the week, that word was Sabbaton and it refuted that it was the first day of the week altogether, that the days that the, the Christianity and Catholicism claimed were the first day of the week was literally Sabbath, Sabbaton, Strong's Concordance G4521. Well, let's look at an example of when they actually say Sabbath and see what it says. Acts chapter 13, verse 42 and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles, now that's important because some translations try to trick you and try to say the people, for, they substitute the word Gentiles for the people to try to hide the fact that these were Gentiles that were going to say this and change the whole meaning of this verse. So let me start again. And when the Jews were gone out, the Jews already left out, out of the synagogue, right? The Gentiles now besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Okay, now let's see if the next Sabbath is the Sabbath. Now, now, now first of all, the, the saying the Gentiles were in the, the congregation on the Sabbath and they wanted to be preached to the next Sabbath. They didn't say preach to us the next day, which is the new Christian holy day, Paul. No, Paul, what they basically said was preach to us the next holy day which is the Sabbath day and which sure ain't Sunday. Because if that were, if Sunday was the holy day all of a sudden, they would have said, hey, Paul, we're in the synagogue this day on the holy Sabbath day that the Jews keep, but we're Gentiles. Please come back and preach to us on our holy day, Sunday, tomorrow. Did the Bible say that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Let's look. <clears throat> now let's look at this word Sabbath. And see if it's the same word that's been saying Sabbath has been all the times we've been looking at it. We click on the tools. We're going to go to the end of the verse. The Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. G 4521. The next Sabbaton. And then it goes on to say, look at verse, the next verse, you know, it, it was basically saying the congregation broken up and many of the Jews and proselytes follow Paul and Barnabas speaking to them and persuading them to continue in the grace of God. And then the next verse locks it in again. And the next Sabbath came and the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Let's click on the tools. See if that word is still Sabbath day, G4521, Sabbaton. Can the prosecution rest his case now? Can I rest my case that Sunday is a bogus day to be sacred? Can I rest my case that Easter Sunday, I'm trying to be respectful and I need to be because I know this is painful for some. So let me settle down. Easter Sunday is a man-made Catholic holiday 
with no biblical truth to it. Christ did not Christ did not rise on Easter Sunday. He rose on Sabbath day. Good Friday is a bogus man-made, Catholic-made religious holiday with no biblical truth to it. Christ was not crucified on a Friday because again, easily to count to three, you can't be in the grave three days and three nights and die on a Friday afternoon, be in the grave before sunset and rise on Sunday morning. That goes against the Bible. Don't go against the Bible Go against your denomination when it teaches you against the Bible. And sadly, your denominations teaches you to break the Sabbath day, the holy fourth commandment, your entire lives. Am I telling you you shouldn't be a Baptist anymore? Am I telling you you shouldn't be a Catholic anymore? You deal with God about that. What I am telling you is that your denomination has been misinforming you your entire life on not just something simple or minor. Like for instance, not something like a head covering. The Bible teaches that women should be in the church should have head coverings. This is this is not as simplistic as that. Your your denomination has been teaching you to break the commandment of God. That's different. It's not something simple like maybe whether tithing is still applicable or not. Again, under Mosaic law which we're not under. The commandments are not Mosaic law, by the way. The commandments is God's law. Mosaic law, the 613 laws of, of Moses were nailed to the cross of Christ. And we thank the Savior for that. According to Colossians chapter two, verse 14, we praise his holy name that the, that the Mosaic laws are nailed to the cross and we have rest from the Mosaic laws. Thank God. Read Acts 15. Acts chapter 15, it tells us that it was a yoke that not that our forefathers couldn't even bear. But the Ten Commandments are different. The, the Mosaic law was written by Moses in a book. The holy ten and perfect commandments were written by God in stone. Two different laws. The Mosaic laws are dead and abolished and nailed to the cross. The holy ten commandments, the perfect and holy ten commandments, are eternal and apply to all mankind. Christians come up with a hundred different excuses why they don't have to keep the Sabbath and that's all they are, empty excuses. Obey God, obey his word. Do not rewrite the scriptures, Christians and Catholics. Do not rewrite the commandments, Christians and Catholics. Obey God. Christ has warned you clearly in Matthew 5, 19, that if you Christians, if you Christians and Catholics or whosoever Christ actually said, shall break the least of the commandments and teach men to do so, they shall be called the least in the kingdom of God. Now he said again, whosoever, he didn't say you Jews, <clears throat> he don't care who you are. Whosoever breaks the least of the commandments and teach men to do so, which is what Christianity and Catholicism does, teaches you to break the Holy Fourth Commandment. But again, he says, whosoever breaks the least, that covers all. Does, does not least cover all? Can you use your, your reasonableness, reasonableness for one minute and say least covers all 10 commandments? You know that it does. Whosoever breaks the least of the commandments and teaches men to do so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. And then in Mark chapter 7, verses 6 through 9, he calls basically those that teach commandment breaking hypocrites. Read Mark chapter 7, verses 6 through 9. He acknowledges that you flatter him and you, you, you honor him with your mouth and your lips but that you don't obey. He says that you would rather keep your tradition, your man-made tradition, he says, and I say he's saying this directly to the Catholic and to the Christian church, that you would rather lay aside the commandment of God, i.e. Sabbath keeping from my mouth, so that you, you, you reject 
the commandment of God so that you can keep your own man-made tradition. Is that not a clear warning to Sunday churches? Because is not Sunday a man-made tradition? A man-made tradition that began hundreds of years after Christ rose from the dead in 364 AD at the Council of Laodicea, Canon 29 and the Catholicism's own catechism, Canon 29 will tell you that the Roman church changed, they, they felt that they had the power and authority to change the Holy Sabbath day from the seventh day to the first day. And not only did they, these men, feel that they could rewrite the commandment of God that was the, the commandment that God wrote with his own finger in stone. Not only did these pompous men, blasphemous men, if you ask me, feel that they could change the holy commandment of God, they changed the, they changed the day from the seventh day to the first day and then added a curse in that canon, canon 29, that if you do keep the Sabbath day, if you do rest on the day that the commandment said to rest, and, 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 and don't rest on the Sunday that they say do, they, they put a curse on you as well. They put a curse on you for obeying the commandment of God and tried to force you to obey the commandments of men. If this is not heresy, I don't know what is. And while we're speaking about the Catholic Church, they did something else to the commandments while I'm talking about it. The, you, we know the commandments, of, the first commandment is to... Uh, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I'm the Lord thy God. I shall have no other gods before me. Well, there was a second commandment, which is still there in Protestant Bibles. But there was a second commandment that said, you shall not bow down to, you shall not make graven images and bow down to them to worship them. The, Cap, the Roman church took that out of their commandments. If you look at the Catholic commandments, they removed that. Why? Well, Maybe because they do bow down to, to idols, as we might call them, or to statues. So they removed that second commandment, but they still have 10 commandments now. What they did is they moved all the other commandments up one. So the fourth commandment of keep the Sabbath day holy is now their third commandment. They still had that in there, the Sabbath day holy, but now they're saying, oh, but the Sabbath day is Sunday. Because remember, we changed that in 364 AD at the Council of Laodicea. Canon 29, the Sabbath is now Sunday. We transferred the holiness of the seven-day Sabbath to the first day. Ain't man a trip? Ain't man a trip? Anyway, so then they moved all the other commandments up one, and then they took, and then they still were, they still had nine commandments. They had a little problem. What did they do? They took the tenth commandment, which was thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, thy neighbor's daughter, thy neighbor's donkey, thy neighbor, you know, that thou shalt not covet. They split that into two, so that now they still can call it the Ten Commandments. That's man. This is what men, this is what they do. Let God be true and all men be liars. I've gone on for almost an hour here. I'm going to let it go. If you got to the end of this, this teaching, this, this heartbreaking, eye-opening, gut-wrenching revelation, God is speaking to you. And let me just tell you this at the end. I know it's not easy to think about honoring God's day that he commands. Should be easy because the Bible says that if we love him, we will keep his commandments. So when you look at it from that perspective, we got to bend our, our will to his will. But my testimony is this. I was a young man. I always believed in God. I, I, had, I, I believed in God from all my life, right? And... I used to go to church, I used to be in a little choir, I, you know, I wasn't saved or nothing, but I was, you know, f from from 10 years old, I was going to little churches and uh, 10 to 12 years old, I, like I said, was very active in churches and things like that, enjoyed church, although I was more interested in the pretty girls that were there than I think the actual, <laughs> but my relationship with Christ, I no laughing matter, I shouldn't laugh about that, but it's true, but I, but I love the things of God, uh, as long as it didn't cost me too much, you know. 
So, but one day I was 15 years old and I, had, I used to go to a church I was very active in. They had moved away where I couldn't walk to the church anymore. So I, I didn't drive. I was too young to drive. So when they moved away to a different church, I stopped going to that church. It was an AME church. And I uh, loved that church. Loved the people and had a couple of fine little, nice little honeys in there too that I liked. But anyway, I digress. But the, I was walking past there one day. Remember when people used to walk? You know, the people don't do too much walking these days. But I was walking past a church, which was maybe a, a couple of miles from my house. And there was a new church in there. And I walked by. I had to see what was going on. After all, this was the church building I spent some years in. Had many a great time in that church. Traveled with the church. They, the choir was was well-renowned and was, was was would would be invited to out of town on bus trips to go sing. And I was in that choir. I wasn't much of a singer, but I was in that choir. And not much of a singer now. So I, I, let me let me get back to my story. Sorry to make this long story longer. I walked past the church one day, and this is this is my Sabbath testimony. I walked past that church, and we, I'd always worshipped on Sunday. I was born and bred a Baptist, basically, even though I went to that AME church, which again felt very Baptist-like to me as well. And I wanted to stuck my head in the door. I saw there were people in there, or at least I saw a person, and I went into the door. And the pastor, who's the pastor and his wife, just a, I think they were just kind of settling down. With, they weren't having service or maybe it was after service. I don't remember all that. I was 15 years old. I'm 60 now. So I went in and I told the pastor, hey, I used to go to this church. Uh, maybe I'll come back and see you. And he let me know that they don't worship on Sundays, that they worship on the Sabbath day. And I was like, the Sabbath day? Um, and... You know, I always had a little question about the Sabbath day. I knew what the commandments were. After all, my very favorite movie in the whole world at the time was that I watched every Easter and Christmas, I guess, was The Ten Commandments. I still love that movie. I even like the musical version. There's a musical version of The Ten Commandments that I enjoy <laughs> with Val Kilmer playing Moses. So anyway, I digress. Um, so he told me about the Sabbath. He sat me down, showed me in the Bible about the Sabbath day. And I was convicted from that day at 15. And I walked out of that church saying, yes, I'm going to keep the Sabbath holy because that's what God commands. Honor his holy day. Do you know that Sunday is a heck of a drug? And I kept the Sabbath. By the time the next Sabbath rolled around, I wasn't keeping the Sabbath. And it took me 20 years to repent of breaking the Sabbath. 15 years old, the Sabbath was still on my mind, but I said, how can that be? How can it really, how can all these churches be so wrong, God? It's got to be, so, uh, they, Billy Graham is wrong. Mother Teresa is wrong. Is this possible? Spurgeon and, and, and Moody, all these old giants of Christian faith, they're all wrong. It's, it's, can, that, can that be possible, Father? So 20 years the Holy Spirit stayed on me about the Sabbath. And sometimes more times more rough on me than others. And it took me 20 years. So I was 35 to I said, until I found out that there were two Sabbaths. You see, I would have stayed in Sunday worship and would have kept disobeying the Holy Commandment of God if I didn't find out that there were two Sabbaths, one Sabbath is the Holy Seven Day Sabbath. The other Sabbath are the ceremonial feast day Sabbaths. And those Sabbaths, the feast day Sabbaths, were under Mosaic law. That's the ones that were nailed to the cross with the other 613 commandments in Mosaic law. But the seventh day Sabbath is separate from the, from the ceremonial Sabbaths. And the uh, seventh day Sabbath is eternal, right along with don't kill, don't commit idolatry, don't commit adultery, don't lie, don't covet, honor your parents, don't blaspheme. All those lovely, perfect, holy laws are still in effect for people that walk with God. And the Sabbath is right there in the middle. As a matter of fact, the Sabbath is the one of the only one of the commandments that he said, remember. And as a matter of fact, the Sabbath is the only is the longest commandment of all the Ten Commandments. It's the one commandment that Yahweh spent more time defining and fine-tuning and making sure you remembered it and making sure you knew how to do it properly. 
And again, in the commandments, it doesn't say don't pick up the air coin. It doesn't say don't heal somebody on the Sabbath. It doesn't say don't get in your car. The, the commandment Sabbath is, is very specific. Don't work. It says, remember it. Don't work your job. Now, if you've got a job that you're, you're saving lives, you're a doctor, you're a nurse, Jesus healed on the Sabbath. It's lawful to do good rather than evil, of course, on the Sabbath day. Those people that are saving lives on the Sabbath, they, I think they get a good, nice pass for healing and saving people. But you're a cashier, you don't, you don't get that pass. You sell cars, you do not get that pass. My busiest day and what the business that I am is a Saturday. And God has helped me to sacrifice this. But I do work the heck out of Sunday. <laughs> so thank God I got six days. He gives us six days to work and to do our own pleasure. Give him the one day he commands. A commandment is not a suggestion. A commandment is just that. It is a direct order from which there is no retreat or compromise. And Sunday Christian, you have been compromising, rejecting, forgetting, denying the Holy Sabbath day your entire life. It's time to repent. It's all you got to do is repent. It's not easy. But when you obey God, he will bring you all the way. Obey the Father. Reject Sunday as a holy day. It's not. It's never been holy. There's no place in the entire Bible that ever will say that the set Sunday is a holy day. So reject it. Obey God. You, and even if you continue to go to church on Sunday, that's your business if you want to do that. But that doesn't excuse you from obeying the seventh day Sabbath. You're going to have to go to, you're going to have to obey the seventh day Sabbath. Maybe in your house. And stay, don't work your job. The, the commandment is clear. Don't work. Your, your household is not to work as well. If you've got children under in your household, they need to be keeping the Sabbath at home with you as well, at least to the best of your ability to get them to do so. Even your servants. If you got a, a business, your business is not supposed to be open on the Sabbath. you got to read the commandment. Chapter 20, verse 8 to 11 of Exodus. Exodus 20, 8 to 11. Not even your service animals are supposed to work on the Sabbath day. He wants it all shut down. He don't want you making income. He don't want you spending income. Shut it down. Give him this one day. Hey, you got six days to make your millions. Make it on those days. Give God his day. I'm going to wrap it up here. Obey God rather than men. Romans 2 verse 13 says, It's not the hearers of the law that are justified before God, but it is the doers that are justified. The law that still stands are the, is the Ten Commandments. The law that is dead is the 613 laws of Moses. The law that still stands are the Ten Perfect and Holy Commandments. The law that is no longer applicable are the 613 laws of Moses. Obey the law, the perfect and holy law of God, and you shall do well. Because if you love him, you will keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous or burdensome, even his Sabbath command. May Yeshua bless you. In his name we pray. Amen.